Welcome everyone. I'm your chair for this session and it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker of today, Professor Filippo Menzer. Uh, Filippo is a distinguished professor of informatics and computer science at Indiana University and director of the Observatory of Social Media. Uh, Dr. Menzer holds a laureate in physics from Sapienza University of Rome and a PhD in computer science and cognitive science from the University of California. San Diego. He has a long list of honors and awards. Uh, Dr. Menzer is a ACM Distinguished Scientist, a fellow of the Center for Computer Mediated Communication, a senior research fellow of the King's Institute, and a board member of the EU Network Science Institute. He has been the recipient of Fulbright Rotary Foundation and NATO Fellowships and a career award from the National Science Foundation. His research interests span web and data science, computational social science, science of science, in modeling of complex information network. His talk today is entitled Four Reasons Why Social Media um, Make Us Vulnerable to uh, Manipulation. So if you have any questions, as Rodrigo mentioned, uh, just post uh, them into the Q&A uh, session of uh, uh, the keynote entry in Google, okay? And um, uh, without further ado, let's get started. Um, Filippo, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Leandro, for that introduction. And thank you and Rodrigo and the other organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, I'm super excited to be at Rexis. This is my first one, and uh, I hope uh, first of many. And uh, it looks like you guys are doing an amazing job uh, with the organization. So congratulations. And uh, I will tell you, um, a little bit about several projects that are going on uh, in our lab at the Observatory of Social Media at Indiana University. And, but I'll try to organize it uh, according to my uh, clickbait title, you know, four reasons why social media make us vulnerable to manipulation. It's in, uh, you know, it's in the theme of manipulation, the, the title itself. So number four, echo chambers. I'll start with the with the story. Uh, something that happened to me, to us, a few years ago. Um, we suddenly became under attack. Our research, our lab, uh, it started out from a small uh, hyper political blog that posted some misinformation, some false uh, claims about our lab, that we were a secret government project working with the Obama administration at that time, basically to spy on American citizens. And that got picked up by some major uh, news and it went viral on Twitter and other social media. Doctored images from our papers were posted. Uh, Non-existing experts and FBI agents were invented, uh, claiming that we were building a database and we were suppressing uh, conservative speech online. Uh, this made it to to major newspapers, to of course Fox News. It was on on prime time many times. There were trending hashtags. It was picked up by some fake news websites like Infowars and others, but it was also picked up by top politicians. Uh, the uh, Republican chair of the House Science Committee announced a formal investigation and so on and so forth. This, of course, was in the run up to the midterm elections in 2014. It all died off right after uh, the elections, but it got also picked up by the by the Russians, by Sputnik, by Russia Today. And uh, it kept actually some of these claims are still circulating. Uh, but if we look at how all of this disinformation campaign um, was mirrored and discussed online, uh, of course, there was a barrage of tweets and they followed the various narratives that were evolving. Um, I won't go into the various details from, you know, being a fascist group and attacking free speech and uh, doing some kind of censorship claims that we were responsible for taking down conservative accounts on Twitter, all of that crazy stuff. But, you know, where was this stuff being discussed on Twitter? So, of course, we were already studying information diffusion and manipulation on social media. So we collected some data. Here is a retweet network of people sharing links to uh, 
disinformation articles with those with those false claims about our um, about our researchers, as well as a few in 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 yellow there that were sharing uh, debunking information, which of course was readily available. The story was fact checked and debunked on Science and other reputable uh, news sources, but. If we look at where this conversation was happening in the context of discussion about the election that was happening back then, uh, well, not surprisingly, as uh, we've known since 2010 and as it has happening today, you know, the discussion of elections on, on Twitter is highly polarized and segregated. The Republicans are you know, sharing what other Republicans are posting. The Democrats are sharing what other Democrats are posting. But if you look at who was posting this fake news about this particular project, it happened to be mostly on one side. The purple nodes here are accounts that were sharing this uh, these particular set of, of fake news and very few on, on the left. And it's hard to see, but you might see two little orange dots on the left. And those are two users who actually shared uh, debunking information. So what we get from this picture is that uh, this information usually doesn't spread evenly across space, right? It spreads um, within certain echo chambers. Uh, so in this particular case, it was a conservative narrative. So it spread in the conservative echo chamber. Other times you may have liberal narratives that spread in the liberal echo chamber. But the point is that, you know, usually the fact checking happens on the other side. So the people who are most vulnerable to being manipulated, the many people who believed these things to be true, they were not exposed to fact checking information. So this is one way in which the polarized segregated structure of our social media make us vulnerable to manipulation because things that um, a particular appeal to one particular group may spread in that group unchecked. Um, we also explore this um, with an experiment in which we deployed some, some bots, some benign bots that were very passive. And, uh, and they, we, we started them at different parts of, of the Twitter sphere. Some started following some conservative news sources, others started following some liberal news sources, but otherwise these bots were all identical to each other. They were just doing completely random things. And after a while, we noticed that the ones that started close to the conservative right of the US uh, started sharing, uh, well, they were resharing what their friends were posting at random and they started sharing uh, links from low credibility sources. Uh, even though these bots have no bias of, of themselves. So this shows that what happened is that they were simply embedded in an echo chamber where a lot of these um, low credibility information, fake news, conspiracy theories, junk science, and so on, these claims were spreading. And so even a random bot would, would uh, start sharing them as well. So this is a very asymmetric uh, situation where it seems that there is much more inf misinformation on the right than on the left. And actually, this is what has been found by other researchers as well. This particular result here is a paper in Science from David Lazar's group at Northeastern um, and uh, just last year. And they found that there was a, a strong correlation between uh, political affinity and likelihood of sharing fake news. In particular, conservatives were much more likely to share these. Now, this was based on a sample of, of likely voters because they were able to cross correlate Twitter accounts with actual voter records. Uh, we also did a similar analysis on a larger scale looking at uh, Twitter accounts in general. And with a lot more data, we were able to pick up a slightly more nuanced signal. Now, we also found this strong correlation on the right. On the x-axis here, you have political bias, conservatives on the right and liberals on the left. And on the y-axis, you have fraction of one's links that are shared um, that, go, that are links to low credibility sources. And so although the correlation is very strong on the right, there is actually a correlation on the left as well. It's weaker, but it's also there. So what this tells us that it's not only conservatives that are vulnerable to misinformation. Conservatives happen to have to be much, much more active on Twitter. And so that's why the signal is so much stronger. However, um, we see that people, partisans of, on both sides of the spectrum can be, um, can be vulnerable. Okay, uh, so in fact, uh, even with those bots that I was telling you earlier, we call them drifter bots, 
uh, we observe that both the ones on the right and the ones on the left found themselves in these echo chambers. And most of them were in echo chambers that tended to be homogeneous. On the left, they were, they were mostly made up of, of conservative people. On the right, they were mostly made up of, sorry, on the left, liberal people, on the right, conservative people. There were a few exceptions. Like here's one that started from, I believe the Washington Post and ended up with a mixed network. Here is another example of somebody that started from the Wall Street Journal and ended up in a, in a liberal network. But usually um, you find yourself in, a, um, in an echo chamber that mirrors um, the first few actions that you make when, when you join a social media platform. So when we see this polarization, these, this segregation, a natural question arises. What is the role of social media in fostering the, evol the emergence of these, uh, you know, of these echo chamber structures. So to do that, we built a model, an agent-based model a simulation, uh, which has two very basic ingredients. One is that people can influence each other. And the other one is that people can choose to unfriend or unfollow those that they disagree with. So here is an illustration with a very small example network here. Each node represents a user. Their colors represent their initial political tendencies, you know, between progressive blue and conservative right. And at the beginning, this is a random network. Everybody follows people at random and the political beliefs are uniformly spread. When we run it, uh, you can see here that the dashed links are links that are cut, you know, people that unfollow people that they disagree with, and solid lines are new links that are created. In this particular case, when you unfollow somebody, you follow somebody else completely at random. So the only bias is in the unfollowing, something that we all do. We see somebody that posts something offensive and we say, eh, I'm gonna unfollow, unfriend that person. So as the simulation runs, you can see two things happening. One, is that the colors are changing. As I said, there is some social influence here. Actually, it doesn't matter how much social influence there is. As long as it's non-zero, there is a small probability that you change your opinion even a little bit based on what's posted by your friends. You see this uniform, uh, the, the, you know, you see all the uh, opinions becoming very uniform. Uh, we have all, all the colors becoming similar to each other, the reds and the blues. And the other thing, of course, is that people cut connections to people that have different opinions. And so we see this emergence of these echo chambers that become more and more segregated. And eventually you only are exposed to information from other people that look just like you. Not only they're conservative or liberal, that, but they are actually aligned. Everybody's sort of aligned uh, uh, with each other. So we have these both polarization with very little diversity or no diversity at all. And eventually you always end up with this segregation. It doesn't matter how little is the chance that you unfollow your friends, you always end up inevitably with this splitting into uh, segregated echo chambers. And you can play with this model. Uh, there is a URL down here. Uh, it's on our, on our website. There is a free demo. You can play with a bunch of different parameters and, and see what happens. So this is part of a paper that just came out in computational social science. And the result are that even uh, as long as you have a non-zero amount of influence and, uh, and uh, selective unfollowing, uh, inevitably and very quickly, you end up with these uh, segregated and polarized echo chambers. In fact, the process could happen even with only one of these two ingredients, but is greatly accelerated by order of orders of magnitude by the presence of both of these mechanisms together. And these two are basic mechanisms that we find in every social media platform. And so it's not surprising that uh, very naturally uh, we end up uh, in, this, in this circumstance. And there is a, a recent paper by my colleague uh, Teha Yasseri that actually shows mathematically, proves mathematically that um, even if you try to implement a recommendation system that tries to mitigate this tendency. Uh, so this is particularly relevant to this audience. Uh, it, it, uh, inevitably, you cannot do anything about it. You can slow it down, but in the end, the outcome is kind of inevitable. So I would, I would really love to see a lot of research into, into ways that can um, address this issue. All right, so that was number four. Number three, information overload. 
Well, I don't need to tell you, we were bombarded uh, with information on our phones. And, but uh, so, so how, how does that affect uh, our vulnerability? Well, here's a picture of a diffusion network. We study these diffusion networks, especially on Twitter, but um, on, uh, on any platforms that we can access. A node, uh, again, represents a user. Connections here represents retweets. And this is a network for the diffusion of one particular article, the article on the bottom left. This is a fake news article completely fabricated. It claimed during the 2016 election that the Clinton campaign was involved in satanic rituals. It was a precursor of things that we see right now spreading virally uh, by the, from the QAnon conspiracy. They follow up on Pizzagate. And right now they focus on satanic rituals involving children's sacrifices and so on. You, you can't, you, it's hard to believe that uh, still four years later, uh, this stuff is uh, spreading virally. Well, this particular uh, article uh, was uh, the most uh, viral uh, that we observed uh, from a bunch of uh, popular disinformation sources during the 2016 election. Uh, the large nodes here are the most influential nodes. They are the ones associated with the with this particular source and its supporters. The colors of the nodes represent the bot score. Um, I'll come back to that later, but you can see some red nodes here. These are nodes that are highly automated. So they're likely to be, uh, you know, probably controlled by the same, by the same sources and they inject and they flood the system with links to this article. And a lot of people are exposed to the article uh, through these secondary sources um, in, in, a, in a coordinated campaigns with these inauthentic accounts. Now, you know, what is the popularity profile uh, of misinformation? This is one piece of news. What if you look at uh, of, of fake news? What if you look at all of them? So this is a plot that shows the distribution of popularity in this particular case, in terms of number of tweets, you get the same curves if you look at number of users, number of posts and so on. And this distribution is very broad. It spans multiple orders of magnitude. So this particular this particular news is in the tail of the distribution. It was shared uh, over 30,000 uh, times. But uh, the worrisome thing is that if you compare the curve for the distribution of these false claims with the curve for the distribution of fact checks, the, you know, reliable uh, news, these two curves are very, very similar to each other. They're almost indistinguishable. So what we would say is that you know, um, low credibility information is just as likely or possibly even more likely according to some uh, work by some colleagues at MIT uh, to go viral than um, just as likely or more likely to go viral um, as, um, as reliable information. All right, so why does this happen? So we are interested in looking at, uh, you know, basic mechanisms that can explain things before looking at the more complex patterns of manipulation. Uh, so to do that, we built another agent-based model that like the one before simulates a social media uh, platform. You have users, they follow each other, they post things or they repost things posted by their friends. And um, in this simulation, whatever somebody posts is just it has a unique ID. You could be a meme, a link, a hashtag, whatever you want. And so we could track the popularity of, um, of, of these memes. Let's call them memes here as a generically something that can be you know, shared and transmitted from person to person. We can measure their popularity as a function of different features of the algorithm. So, in, so we looked at different mechanisms and we found that two ingredients were sufficient to explain this broad distribution of popularity that we observed in the empirical data. And the two conditions are one is that the network itself, the structure of the social network has to look like the structure of actual social network, online social networks. So what does that mean? Well, it has to have hubs and it has to have clustering. Um, and if the network, if the network does not look like that, for example, if you have a random network, then you're not likely to see these broad distributions of virality. In other words, you're not likely to see things that spread uh, you know, very, very virally. And the second ingredient is limited attention. In, we, in our model, we could assume that people only look at some number of the top things on their feed. And this could be a parameter, you know, it could be a probabilistic parameter. And, and it turns out that if they can look at pretty much everything, um, 
and they can retweet pretty much anything at random, you don't see this, this long tail. But if they only look at a small subset of things at the top, which is typical for all of us because we are you know, overwhelmed with information, then you see this, uh, this, broad degree, this broad popularity distribution. So in other words, you don't need to come up with more complicated explanations about some things being good to, or interesting to explain why they go viral. In this, in this simulation, these are completely random things, right? They're just random numbers. So, and yet some things go super viral. So it is, you can explain that simply by looking at the structure of the network and the limited attention. Now, what if, now again, in that model, things are, people are sharing things completely at random. What if you assume that there are, that each item has some quality to it and that people uh, prefer to share memes with high quality, okay? So let's say that of the things that you see on your screen, uh, you're more likely to share the ones that have high quality. What happens now? Is it, is it the case that now the better quality memes are more likely to go viral? Well, yes, but not to a large degree, okay? So here um, we, we have in this density plot, we, on the x-axis, we, we, we have information load. So how much new, uh, many new memes are produced, which means how many new things end up on your feed. And on the y-axis, we have attention. How many of those people are likely to see? And uh, the color represents the correlation between quality and popularity, okay? So a darker red is, is good. It means that the higher quality memes are more likely to spread virally. And you see that these correlations are pretty slow, uh, low, but they're higher when there is lower information load or higher attention. Okay, so here's an example. In this network, the size of the nodes represent the quality. So you can see that a lot of these nodes are large. It means most of the things that are being shared on the network are higher quality. Uh, but when the information load is higher and or the attention is lower, we see a much lower correlation. Here is an example, this network on the right, where you see that many of the nodes are smaller. There is more diversity, but more junk. More, a lot of junk uh, is, is basically flooding, flooding the network. Uh, so this helps us interpret um, yet another factor that may lead to vulnerability to misinformation, just the flooding. What about platform bias? Because so far we are assuming that, you know, that, that there are no biases. And, and we could think of different kinds of biases on platforms. Uh, so for example, going back to our, our study with our bots, uh, we looked at political bias. Uh, you know, uh, is it the case that what these bots post or the information that they are exposed to by their, uh, by their friends in their, in their home timeline, um, you know, does it tend to flow to the right and, or to the left? And it turns out that the bots that started to the left got shifted towards the center. Whereas the ones that got started on the right pretty much stayed on the right. So in this case, it seems that there is a, there is a political bias. This is on Twitter, but it's not the bias that Twitter is always accused by of liberal bias. It's the other way around. It's a conservative bias, but it turns out that this is not due to Twitter's algorithms. We actually looked at whether there was um, bias in the selection, in the ranking algorithm that, uh, that Twitter uses to sort the things that appear on your, on your uh, news feed. And that's not the case. Uh, that algorithm um, does not have a political bias. So this kinds of bias that we observe here is the result of the environment, all right, of the ecosystem, of the fact that people end up following people on the right or on the left and the differential activity uh, within the different echo chambers. Another kind of uh, platform bias is popularity bias or engagement bias. A lot has been written about this. Uh, there are uh, huge numbers of papers. And you know, at the basis of this, there is the wisdom of the crowd. The, uh, obviously popularity or engagement is a very strong signal that platforms can use to get a hint about what's, what people are going to be interested in. If, if a lot of people, and especially a lot of your friends are sharing something, then probably you would be interested in it too. And so obviously platforms use this signal to decide you know, how to rank things on your, on your feed. So we wanted to study 
how well this work, how well the, 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 the um, you know, the wisdom of the crowd is realized in a very, very simple model, similar to the ones I described before. But here, uh, things are ranked on the feed and they're ranked according to a mix of two factors. One is the actual quality of a meme that we generate in the model. And the other one is its popularity. How many other people have shared this meme so far? So on the x-axis, we have a parameter that shows uh, how, the importance of popularity in this algorithm. One means that the ranking is completely based on popularity. Zero means it's completely based on quality. Okay, so to the words the right, you have engagement bias or popularity bias. On the y-axis, you have this idea of attention that I've described before. How deep do things go through in their search results or in their social media feed uh, to decide what to share? And you see that in the majority of cases, as you increase the engagement bias, the average popularity, which, which is in, uh, sorry, the average uh, meme quality in the system, which is indicated by the color here, so darker means lower, uh, the average quality gets worse, okay? And this happens both with, uh, you know, with low attention and with high attention. So this means that in general, engagement bias actually makes things worse. It, um, it amplifies initial noise, things that initially random seem to become popular and then the platform itself amplifies that. Now, you might say, this is weird. What about the wisdom of the crowd? Well, there is a narrow, a narrow range here for a narrow set of values for, for the attention. When you, when you look at just enough things, not too many, not too few, in that case, some engagement bias actually helps as you can see here, right? So the quality actually gets better. So this is the, this is the um, circumstance in which the wisdom of the crowd works. And the initial popularity bias is a useful signal to pull out quality things faster. But if you then, increase the popularity bias, popularity bias even more, then things get bad again. So we have to be really careful when we develop recommendation and ranking systems for in social systems to think about um, the lar potential large scale consequences. We may be increasing engagement, but we might actually uh, decrease the overall quality and health of the information ecosystem. Now, this is the platform itself using engagement signals. What about the users? We, these engagement signals are exposed to us when we, you know, when we, when we look at our feed on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, it tells us how many people shared this, how many people liked it, how many comments there were. And so what is the effect of that uh, on the vulnerability of the end users. So we explored this question with an app called Fakey, uh, which is available. If any of you want to uh, play with it you, uh, on, on iPhones or Android devices, it simulates a, a news feed like, like what you would see on Facebook and Twitter. It shows you current news, uh, either from mainstream sources or from low credibility sources. And, and it's a game, you have to decide from the information that you see on the screen, which is typically what we see you know, on our phones, the picture, the headlines, the short description, you have to decide whether to share it or to fact check it or to flag it for fact checking. And what we found uh, in an experiment in which we were manipulating the, uh, the engagement signal, we were telling people how many people had liked or shared an item. Um, we found that this created more vulnerability to low credibility articles. So in other words, people were more likely to share low credibility articles when they felt, they thought that more people had, um, uh, more people had engaged with them. And they were less likely to fact check uh, articles from low credibility sources when they thought that, um, that more people had shared it. So just seeing that something is going viral makes us vulnerable, which of course means that you can game that. You can create fake accounts and bots and create the appearance of popularity. So you can trick both the platform algorithm and the end users. You kill two birds or maybe 200 million birds um, with a stone. All right, uh, and finally, uh, number one is manipulation. And this is actually, what, uh, what we do a lot in our lab. We study manipulation. We've been doing this since 2010 when we started looking at these diffusion networks on Twitter and we found these really weird uh, 
uh, uh, network plots. Like this one on the right is three users. And, uh, you know, the edge between the users, uh, blue meant the retweet, was, you know, the thickness was proportional to the number of retweets. And we thought there was a bug in our code when we saw this picture. And then we realized that it wasn't. And these were two accounts that were retweeting each other tens of thousands of times within a short period of time. And these were the first bots that we discovered. In fact, we coined the term social bots uh, when, we, when we observed this, this behavior. And of course, now everybody knows what social bots are and, and we've been studying them since then. These two particular bots were promoting a candidate. This is a, a, a candidate. They were mentioning that candidate, uh, posting favorable news about that candidate and then retweeting each other. And they were able to make the name of that candidate go trending on Twitter. Uh, this was during the 2010 midterm elections. Uh, on the left, you have, we have another case. Um, this was interesting because it was not only a case of a bunch of social bots, but also uh, the first example of a fake news website that we observed in the wild. Uh, we predicted this many years before, but 2010 is when we actually found this is the first one that we observed. It was a fake news, news website uh, made by a uh, political consultant in Pennsylvania to uh, support certain candidates that paid him and to attack and smear, um, you know, other candidates that ran against them. And uh, this bunch of accounts look like uh, church accounts. They were all fake. And they all uh, posted links to these fake news websites mentioning an influential user. This node in the center is the influential user. It could be a journalist or, 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 or a politician. And the hope was that that person would then retweet it and that would reach uh, many people. And this is a technique that is still used today and I'm gonna come back to it later. Uh, so what happens when we look at the diffusion of low credibility news uh, articles on a much larger scale? Uh, so this is the portion of the, of the network that we built uh, from data from our system Hoxie, which is a system that tracks the spread of links from low credibility sources. And it also visualizes uh, diffusion networks. And uh, here in purple, we see uh, the sharing of links from low credibility sources in orange from fact checking sources. And uh, of course, you see that people who share low credibility uh, information are less likely to share fact-checking information and, and vice versa. Again, homophily or echo chambers. But as you dig into the core of this system, one thing that we observe is that we, there, are, there is more and more automated activity, okay? Uh, you use a bot detection algorithm, you find that on average, the accounts that are closest to the core of this network are more likely to be automated. And this is not surprising. It's an easy way to manipulate in the ways that I was telling you earlier by creating accounts that just automatically amplify stuff. And in fact, this was also found by our, our drifter bots. Um, the ones that started on the, on the extreme, on the right and on the left, um, were more likely to, uh, to, to have friends, so to, be, uh, to, 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 to follow uh, inauthentic accounts but they were all followed by inauthentic accounts. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier this idea of, of targeting. Uh, this, this was also happening during the 2016 elections. The idea is that uh, you create an inauthentic account and then you target influential users, whether they're news sources or politicians, hoping that they will retweet uh, and reshare what you post. So we found a, a significant signal there. Automated accounts were more likely to mention influentials. Uh, let me just show you an example here. This little yellow dot, this was a bot that systematically uh, replied to uh, posts from mainstream news sources, all of them. And all these replies had a link to a particular piece of fake news, which was on Infowars. And it was the claim that 3 million illegal aliens had voted. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, Clinton won the, the popular vote. And, um, and uh, this, this was done only in reply to messages that mentioned Donald Trump, okay? So the target here was Donald Trump. Uh, this particular bot was designed to get this fake news on the screen of Donald Trump. And sometime later, Donald Trump repeated uh, this claim. Uh, 
said that he had seen it in some article. And the only source that, uh, that it was out there was this um, Info, uh, Infowars article, which uh, attributed this claim to a suspended Twitter account. So targeting is one of the techniques that social bots can use for manipulation. Uh, here, uh, we looked at um, what happened in the first instance after a link to a low credibility uh, article uh, was posted. And, uh, you know, we could use the data, the data from Hoxie to go back in time. And we noticed that in the first few seconds, in the first 10 seconds, you could see traces of automation, of inauthentic uh, automated accounts of bots. But later, as more pe you normal people like you guys and me uh, share these things, then it's very hard to see the traces of those initial bots, right? Because by now, most of the people who share it are humans. But uh, if you look at the first few seconds, you could see that bots were used to amplify. And then the last uh, technique or strategy that, uh, or tactics that uh, bots use, of course, is flooding. Uh, we see that uh, here we see the distribution of times that one account shares the same link to a low credibility source. So you can see that one account can share a link up to thousands, many thousands of times. What is the effect on humans? So we looked at retweets, for example, and it turns out that most of the retweets come from humans. Uh, I'm summarizing here because I don't want to run out of time. Most of the retweets are actually coming from likely humans. These are retweets of low credibility source, uh, low credibility articles. But when you look at what the humans retweet, they actually retweet other humans, but they also retweet likely bots. So this is one way in which the manipulation can have impact, it's simply by flooding the system with junk and then having humans that reshare it. And we also observed this recently. We look credibility about the coronavirus. Um, we found that uh, um, uh, links to low credibility sources about the coronavirus was, were as uh, viral as the ones from credible sources like the CDC or the New York Times, and that, um, and that uh, um, th they shared a lot through uh, uh, bots, uh, through uh, automated accounts, as opposed to the links from, um, you know, articles from, from reputable sources. Uh, this, this network is a few years old. It's the first time that we observed how uh, automated accounts, again, shown in, in red here, could have a big impact in online discussions. This was a discussion that was happening years ago about vaccination uh, policies in, in California, a bill that would make it harder for parents to get exemption to, to required vaccinations for their children. And we found that there were some automated accounts that were very, very influential. Uh, here are, these are the large red notes. So we wanted to study this um, in, a, in a quantitative setting. So we created another model like the ones that I mentioned before, but here the new ingredient is that you ha we have a bunch of bots that infiltrate the network and they just flood the network with junk, with low credibility information. So here the bots are shown in red, the humans are shown in blue and the color of the humans represent how much of the junk of the low quality information posted by the bots they reshare. Okay, so darker is bad, means low quality. And we looked at a bunch of different parameters, but uh, one was deception, how well uh, these messages were crafted by the inauthentic accounts or the people running those inauthentic accounts to be appealing to people so that people would be more likely to share them. Uh, we call this deception. And the other one was infiltration. Uh, how well could the fake accounts infiltrate the network and get humans to follow them? And it turned out that infiltration had a much stronger effect than deception. Um, well, in both cases, of course, deception makes things worse. But um, irrespective of deception, if the bots can infiltrate the network better, then they can do a lot, a lot more damage. In fact, there is kind of a, a critical threshold of about 1%. If you can infiltrate roughly 1% of the network, then you can drive the quality of the overall system very down, almost close to zero. You can basically dominate uh, the information ecosystem. You can basically, by flooding, you're basically suppressing quality information in the system. 
Okay, but automation is not the only way to manipulate the system. So let's look at this account, for example. If you look at this account in, in isolation, it doesn't look suspicious, okay? It doesn't look like a bot at all. It's, it's a human. And this happened to be an anti-Trump account. Fine, uh, nothing particularly strange with it. However, what if I showed you this other bunch of accounts? Now you would say, hmm, they look suspiciously similar. And in fact, they do. Uh, obviously, somebody was using a template, same pictures, same hashtags, same style, creating different fake websites, different accounts. They're all obviously controlled by one single entity here. And notice that some are anti-Trump and some are pro-Trump. In fact, this particular guy was running a network where he was trying to raise money by claiming uh, that this was money raised on behalf of a political campaign. And in, the, in so doing, it was basically trying to steal money from both pro-Trump and anti-Trump uh, Twitter users. So the way that we found this particular uh, coordinated network was by looking at networks that shared uh, their handle, their Twitter handle uh, with each other. Uh, this is something that occasionally can happen, but we found that it was ha happening systematically. So we found large network of, of accounts that all shared the same handles with each other. And this is actually a technique that can be used to evade uh, deception. We've, we've noticed it, uh, we've, we've seen accounts doing things that violate the terms of service, uh, posting, for example, manipulated video, uh, and then they change their handle and then they don't get suspended uh, by Twitter. Um, but uh, we, uh, we, we, we use this uh, technique of detecting coordinated networks, coordinated inauthentic networks in a lot of different domains. So the previous example was by looking at similarity in terms of their handles. Uh, this is an example of based on link similarity, accounts that share the exact same set of links. And so these were particularly fake news about uh, the, the, the pandemic. And we could see these uh, networks of accounts that all are very, very similar to each other. They all share exactly the same links, okay? So it's very unlikely that independently a bunch of different accounts would share exactly those set of links. So this is obviously these clusters are coordinated uh, campaigns. Um, this is a similar technique based on sharing the same images or very, very similar images, slightly different variations of the same images. This was during the Hong Kong protest. It was used both on the pro-protest and the anti-protest side. We find these coordinated groups that were all sharing the exact, exact same uh, sets of, of images. Um, uh, here, here, these are coordinated groups uh, that are attacking the white helmets in Syria. And uh, these were detected by finding that they were all retweeting the same, the same accounts, okay? So there is a controller and then there is a bunch of bots that uh, they retweet that. Um, here's uh, cases of fraud. Uh, these are uh, pump and dump schemes for cryptocurrencies. And um, we found them by looking at synchronization of messages. These are Twitter accounts that all post at exactly the same times as each other. And this is because of course, these accounts are coordinated to try to pump the price of a cryptocurrency. And then when the price goes above a certain, uh, a certain level, then you know, the people behind them sell them and, and they make a profit. And this happens uh, all the time. And here's an example of coordination detected on the base of content. On the left here, these are accounts that share the exact same sequences of hashtags. Uh, we found this both in the pro and the anti-Trump camps. And sometimes these accounts use apps, okay? So apps post on their behalf. So we found an app called Backfire that uh, these uh, anti-Trumpers were using to let their account basically become a bot controlled by an organization. And this was done on the right and on the left. And very recently, just a few days ago, there was an article in the Washington Post where we analyzed um, a, a, a very similar type of campaign that was detected by finding that the accounts were sharing the exact same content. It was all copied and pasted from a Google doc. And these, these were teens in Arizona they were acting as if they were Russian trolls or, or American trolls in this case. And they were paid by a political action uh, committee to, uh, to post these messages and make it look like they were coming from young people. And they were all in replies to news sources. So again, the targeting. 
Okay, uh, so these are ways in which we're vulnerable. Um, before I wrap up, let me say that we have a bunch of tools uh, that we develop at our observatory that can be useful to study uh, the, the manipulation of social media. Uh, you may have heard of Botometer. It's a very popular machine learning tool to detect social bots. We recently launched a new, uh, a new version, which now tends to find a lot of AstroTurf accounts um, across the political spectrum. And we get some pushback because of that. Um, Hoxie is a tool that, as I mentioned before, lets you visualize a network of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the diffusion network for either anything that you can search on Twitter or articles from a bunch of low credibility sources that we are tracking. And it shows you whether um, this particular article or meme is shared by humans or by bots. It's connected with, uh, with Botometer. Uh, we recently uh, launched a new tool called Bots Layer. Uh, basically, it lets you launch your own platform in the cloud to track either accounts or topics. It extracts entities from these topics, and then it uses various algorithms to see whether uh, there are narratives that are pushed by bots or that are pushed by accounts that are likely coordinated with each other. And it lets you focus on things that are trending or popular. It lets you do research on various platforms to see where these are coming from. And it lets you visualize uh, these, um, these diffusion networks using Hoxie. Here is an example that we found uh, when we first set up the system. We found this bunch of Russian bots that were all spreading a fake news video attacking Bill Browder. For those of you who know, um, he's, uh, he's a person that, um, uh, that has been under attack by Russia for, for a long time. All right, so I think I'm out of time. Uh, just to summarize, uh, the interplay of cognitive, social, and algorithmic biases make us vulnerable to misinformation. Uh, social bots and other coordinated uh, campaigns can exploit these vulnerabilities. And tools to study information diffusion networks, bots, and coordinated influence campaigns may help us understand and counter the manipulation of information ecosystems. Uh, this is a shameless plug. We just published a textbook on network science. Uh, so if you're interested, um, please let me know. And I want to close by thanking uh, my wonderful team. All the work that I've shown you is the work of these people. These are my fantastic students, postdocs, and colleagues here at the Observatory on Social Media. And I also want to thank our funders that uh, are enabling this research. And with that, I thank you. And I hope that there is still time for, for uh, questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, Philippe, for the great and timely uh, talk. So that you know, we have right now uh, 965 people attending. So wow, that's wow, that's really great. Thank, thanks everybody for joining. I'm us. amazed. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And there has been a lot of uh, interaction also on your talk, and uh, so we have some time for questions. So I'll just pick uh, some of these questions here, and just remember that you can always uh, continue this discussion later. You just need to go to your keynotes and you see all the interactions that have happened there. Okay? Excellent, will do. Uh, then uh, let's start with the question of uh, Himan Abdullapuri. Uh, apologies for any uh, mispronunciation of your name, uh, of your names, people. Uh, so the question is, what strategies or policies would you recommend to protect users from manipulation? Okay, this is a tough one. Uh, I, I, I need to try not to talk for an hour about this. So in summary, one thing that I would say is do not use social media as your source of information. Uh, we know that social media can be manipulated. We know that it's hard to know where information is coming on social media. We know that people are confused by the difference between you know, uh, reliable sources and non-reliable sources, opinions versus facts whether things are shared by other people or we are being manipulated by bots. This is very hard to tell on social media. It's hard to understand the bias of being in an echo chamber. So the best thing is just to use social media for what it was originally designed for, which is great. Get, be in touch with your kids, with, you know, post pictures of your cats and dogs. That's fabulous. But don't read the news there. Re read the news by going to sources that you trust. Uh, and if we could convince people to do that, which is... Uh, 
uh, unlikely, uh, things would probably be a lot better. You know, um, I, I sometimes sometimes people are surprised that I say this, but even Fox News, and I don't mean the the com comment part and the editorial part of, of Fox News, but the news part of Fox News, even that is a much much better source of reliable, trusted news than your social, your Facebook feed or your or your Twitter feed. Um, so pick a trusted, uh, reliable news source, uh, maybe your local newspaper, maybe a major uh, newspaper, so hopefully something that is not too, too politically polarized and, uh, and get your news from that. Uh, that's, that would be the number one uh, advice. Okay, so the next question comes from Gura K. Uh, Patro. And the question is, does personalization of services play a role in social media manipulation? If yes, uh, has it become easy to manipulate just because there is social segregation in social networks? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's one of the messages that I was trying to push. So I completely agree with that. Uh, personalization means show people more of what they want. And uh, that, of course, increases engagement. So I think a lot of the people here are experts about how to do that. And we're very, very good at doing that. You guys are very good at doing that. Uh, but you have to be aware of the side effects of that, of the consequences. If you give people what they want, they may end up wanting more and more extreme uh, stuff because that's the stuff that gets engagement, uh, stuff that gets them mad or angry. And emotional responses is a great predictor of engagement. So algorithms that are good at showing you what you want are likely to show you things that you agree with and to reinforce and amplify selective attention and uh, other uh, you know, uh, cognitive and social biases like uh, bandwagon effects. Uh, you you want to share things just because your friends share it or be, and, and that's the stuff that you are shown by the recommendation algorithm. Uh, and uh, you end up only paying attention to things that reinforce your own pre-existing belief. Another well-known uh, uh, bias, confirmation bias. So all of these uh, social and cognitive biases can be reinforced by uh, personalization. And so we have to be aware that personalization actually can be weaponized. And that's what you can usually do with the bot. The bots that I showed you in this experiment, they were just following whatever the platform would show them at random. And they ended up following bots, being followed by bots, sharing low credibility information. And, uh, and so that's the result of just being in, in, this, in this environment and uh, being recommended things that, they, that the algorithms thought they wanted to see. Uh, so yes, I think that that's a huge vulnerability. Okay, uh, the next one is, any thoughts on how to protect kids and students from the influence of social media, the steps we can take individually as a research, as a researcher? That's a very good question. I confess that I have not given it much thought, so I'm, I'm not an expert on this, so I don't want to take precious time, but I think it is important. And especially as we see that kids are uh, more and more spending time on social media, especially ones that are designed with kids in mind. TikTok is the obvious example that is on all of our minds. And just in the last few days, we've seen a lot of articles of studies that are beginning to come out about uh, um, the spread of conspiracy theories on, on TikTok. Uh, as an example, QAnon, which is a American political conspiracy theory, which is now spreading all over the world um, with, with crazy stories of, uh, of, 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 of pedophilia and satanic rituals and secret cabals and... And, and so on and so forth. This stuff is spreading like fire on social media that are specifically targeted at kids. Kids are probably easier to influence. They have even less critical thinking than adults. And believe me, adults don't have much of it. Uh, and so, yeah, we have to be very concerned about uh, what information our kids are exposed to on TikToks. Uh, I'm very happy when my daughter uh, is on TikTok and looks at fun things and entertaining things and, and you know, fun songs and dances. That's amazing. I love it. But um, uh, we have to be careful that that's not all that they are exposed to. Okay, I think we have time for one more. This comes from Dmitry Goldenberg, and the question is, 
Can you distinguish between the effects of the platform's algorithm and the natural social phenomena? It's, it's hard to do because, of course, the effects of the algorithm are intertwined with the effects of the individual choices that we make. So we attempt to do that sometimes. Some of the work that I showed here attempts to tease these things out. For example, in, in a simulation environment where we can assume that humans do something and the platforms do something, and then we can measure the effect of these two. But studies in the wild are very, very hard. There are issues of, uh, including issues of ethics, uh, you know, manipulating content is something that platforms do without telling us, but when they actually do it and publish the results, there is a lot of backslash, right? People, uh, people are manipulated all the time, but they don't want to know about it. Um, so uh, it's, I think it's very, very hard to tease apart these factors in, in real world experiments. Although there is a growing body of literature uh, running experiments, trying to look into that. But I think we're at the very beginning here. There is a lot more work that needs to be done. It, it's a complex systems of interactions between algorithmic biases, social bias and co social biases and cognitive biases. So I think this is a very, uh, a very big uh, open area for research. Okay, so let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank and you so much. Thank you all for joining the session. Uh, remember to check out our social activities over next next hour. In particular, uh, next you will have uh, our sponsor uh, sponsor exposition from iFood. iFood recommendations. Uh, I hope to see you there and, and around. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.